folks. Um, our final speakers are Dr. Ted Schroeder and Dr. Glenn Tunsor from uh, the Agricultural Economics Department here at Kansas State. Um, they have 103 slides that Dr. Schroeder just showed me, or Dr. Tunsor, excuse me, so I hope you're not hungry. Um, but with them, I'll, I'll let them start their talk so we can get a, things going. Thank you, John. Uh, we do have 103 slides. We're going to show you about 15. Okay, so there's a whole host of uh, resources for the three of you in the room that want all those charts. They're in this PowerPoint that'll be on the web. So uh, the 103 is a bit of an exaggeration. But with what team we have left, uh, Ted and I are going to try to cover all things economics that haven't been touched on. Right, there's been a lot of stuff thrown at you. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges uh, facing everybody in the room. I think it's fair to say our first two presenters establish that for us. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to give a status of the industry from an uh, outlook perspective, and I'm going to hand it over to Ted to, uh, in many ways, pick up what Steve kind of left us off with and talk about some global demand issues. And hopefully, we'll give you enough material to have some more questions. Uh, we won't lock the door and keep you from getting the lunch. All right, so if I had to give you four big bullet points of what I think 2013 looks like or, uh, you know, kind of a situation summary, is in many ways, I think we have a lot of certainty on tight supplies and a lot of uncertainty on demand, okay? And again, we're gonna come back to demand with uh, Ted's remarks in particular, but more so in 2013 in the past, right? Demand's always important, but I think we're gonna watch for demand strength even more than we have in the past, mainly because that's the part we don't know as much about, right? We know we have tight supplies, strength of demand is gonna dictate cattle prices in 2013, 2014, okay? Dry weather persistence or recovery, I'd love to tell you if the drought's gonna you know, end, but I'm not a weatherman, so don't ask. But I do recognize it's a big deal, right? So everybody's setting to watch and see if their ponds get better, if the pasture conditions get better, if we're gonna grow that record-setting corn crop, right? There's a lot of things that are hang hanging on weather that I can't tell you if it's gonna rain or not, but we're all sitting watching, okay? The other part, uh, in the spirit of politically un uh, sensitive things, excess capacity concerns are still gonna be talked about in 2013. Uh, we could talk about that more in our Q&A if you want, but 2013, 2014, I think we're going to have some more capacity resolution going on in the industry. And at the end, uncertainty abound. Uh, you know, we're sitting here on the wonderful day of sequester, all right? There's lots of examples of uncertainty, uh, not just in D.C., but certainly what's going on in D.C. adds to the uncertainty environment, and there's a lot of economic implications of that, right? Whether it's delaying cow-calf expansion, whether it's reduced uh, willingness to hang around for better margins for other segments, the uncertainty has a notable economic implication for this industry. I have one slide each for each main, main segment in the industry in the spirit of time. Uh, for the cow-calf sector, I do think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic, uh, particularly if you come from a ranch that has a better than average cost structure, I'd be very optimistic, right? And if I could tell you it was gonna rain, I'd be even more optimistic, but I can't tell you that yet, right? But the rain point really gets into a timing thing, right, in terms of how good 2013 will be, as opposed to more generally, if I think things are gonna be good, right, in the short term for cow-calf producers, okay? That tight supply situation is advantageous for the cow-calf producer, no doubt about it, okay? I think it's also important to recognize there's a widening gap between the top third and bottom third in, within the cow-calf industry. That's been going on for a while. Uh, some of you have heard me in the past give belabored talks on this. Uh, the drought in many ways, I think, magnifies that. Anybody that's better than average at ma uh, managing the operation in normal times I think is gonna be even better than average in stress times, right? They have some unique managerial skill or they're more hands-on or whatever the case is. So I think as we look back at 2012 and probably even looking back at 2013, we're gonna see continued widening of returns within this sector. And that has direct implication on who will do the expansion, okay? Again, you can give a whole talk on this and where the herd is gonna expand when we pull the trigger on that. But just to kind of motivate this, a $100 difference in your cost per cow, if you're a cow-calf operator, equates to roughly $400 difference in the net present value of a replacement. So who's gonna be bidding more for replacements when we pull the trigger, All right? Somebody that has an advantage in the cost structure, okay? Again, we can come back to this, but understanding where you're at from a cost standpoint within the cow-calf sector is very important, always is, but even more so in today's environment. When you look at the Stocker side of things, all right, we're also in the middle of Flint Hills, Stocker in a part of the industry. There's high value of gain. I think that's here to stay, but there's high cost of gain, and that may well be here to stay also, okay? In many ways, for those of you that come to Stocker Field Day, you've heard me talk about, I think there's more opportunity for the Stocker segment than there used to be, but I also think there's more risk than there used to be, right? When things go wrong, right, when you have hiccups, there's more on the table, right? Those animals are worth more, and the forage you're consuming and so forth are worth more than they used to be. So it's even more important to actively manage that segment, 
But there's a lot of reasons to be bullish for that segment because that's the segment the industry asks to put more pounds on before we get to the feedlot to reduce our use of number two yellow corn, right? It's hard to see that particular fundamental part of the stalker industry changing anytime soon. And in general, I think that's bullish for this segment. Some projections, right? Those value of gain projections from 120 to 140 depend on the exact scenarios you use. We didn't used to talk about that, right? There's a lot more potential positive margin for this segment than there used to be. Everybody that's bought you know, forage recently or looks out at their less than green pasture situation knows the cost side is also elevated. Finally, feedlot sector. Uh, 2012 was a historically bad year uh, from a, just a pure profitability standpoint for a typical feed yard. Uh, the numbers vary a lot depending on who tries to benchmark it. We can debate if the benchmark numbers are precisely accurate or not. I won't define, you know, defend this to the $5 per head, but I am very confident 2012 was a very stressful year and uh, 2013 has some notable challenges ahead of it also. A lot of that has to do with excess capacity, and what I mean by that is more bunk space than we need relative to the calf crop in North America, right? That's the politically sensitive thing we all have to recognize going on. Same thing in many ways happens on the processor side, right? I'm not gonna give you belabored points on processing, but there's a challenge there as well. I do think that issue is gonna get worse before it gets better. If we do pull the trigger on expansion, there'll be a certain number of heifers that don't go through the supply system for a year that will make that capacity story worse, but that's a necessary evil in order to grow the herd. All right, I'm not gonna read these numbers to you. Uh, you can get these on your own. LMIC uh, puts out quarterly projections. The trend is what I wanna get across to you today. Uh, 2013, 5% fewer commercial slaughter. 2014, almost 6% fewer slaughter. In many ways, that's dictated by the cow herd we have now and what we had last year, right? Pretty certain that beef supplies are going to dwindle throughout 2013, 2014. We're gonna offset that number reduction in head a little bit with heavier dress weights, but you can't negate it, okay? So there's gonna be a net reduction in per capita supplies of beef in 2013, 2014, which in many ways sets the stage for the demand discussion, I'm gonna hand the mic to Ted here in just a second on. But the question is, right, who's going to expand the herd, how big will the herd become, right, and what will the industry size be going forward? In many ways, that is a big part of the opportunity set, right, how large the industry is gonna be that we're all participating in. This is the uh, next to last slide I'm gonna show you, and it's a historical chart going back to 1999 that shows you USDA's estimate for the January beef cow herd size, okay? Back in 99, it was 33.8 million was the estimated herd size. The most recent estimate, January of 2013, was 29.3, okay? So now, to wake everybody up, I'm gonna make you raise your hand, or I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, I can't make you. In 10 years, how large do you think the beef cow herd will be in the US? How many of you think it'll be more than 35 million head? Okay. How many of you think it'll be between 30 and 35 million head? Okay. How many of you think it'll be between 25 and 30 million head? How many think it'll be less than 25 million head? All right. I don't necessarily disagree with the first two, you know, the majority vote, right, being groups two and three. It's also worth noting, since I can see everybody, but you guys can't see yourselves very well, there's uh, more young people that raised their hand on number two. All right, uh, that's worth noting. Some of the bullishness in the room thinks there's gonna be more expansion, right? Some of the more bearishness in the room is a little bit older. That's not surprising. It's worth noting. I will share with you, uh, USDA every year puts out 10-year projections on a host of things. And just uh, back here in February, they recently put out a projection on what they think the herd is gonna be in 10 years, right? So to give you some context on not what Glenn thinks, but what USDA thinks and answering that previous question, I won't read every number here again because we're short on time, but USDA is projecting in 2022, so 10 years out, that that number will be 33.5 million head. Okay, so for context on the question I asked you, that's what they're projecting, all right? It's also worth noting, per capita supplies are the blue line on here, uh, not bottoming out until 2015. So to that point on tight supplies, discussions on retail prices, how strong demand is, so forth, we're just getting started in that. Right, we're gonna have more discussions about how high beef prices have to go in order to improve margins in the beef industry, okay? Another thing before I totally hand this off to Ted is this is updated every year and USDA is projecting the total herd to be more than a million heads smaller 10 years from now than they were a year ago. So I'll say that again. In February of 2012, they were predicting 10 years out, the beef herd would grow by more than a million head than they predicted last month. Why? Cost, cost situation changed. 
right? They're basically predicting that the industry will not grow as much because we have a higher cost environment, right? It won't be as advantageous to grow to the same level they were thinking a year ago. A new projection will come out a year from now, right? The world will change and so forth. But as you try to get your arms around how large this industry is going to be going forward, that's something that we all should back up and pause on. Because if you're debating how to keep the uh, farm family going forward, right, a function of that is profitability of the enterprise and more generally the industry. So there's a lot of discussions on if and when we're going to expand the herd. USDA is thinking we will. I think we will too when it starts raining. And I think we might put those wheels in motion in 2014 if 2013 proves to be a more normal weather year. Okay, so that's my best attempt to quickly give you a status update, and I'm going to let Ted take over. Oh, you want? I'm wired. Oh, well, you could you, cut me off. I'm sorry. You, Go ahead. You, you've got control of the. Uh, you want me to take that too? Can okay. I keep this? Yeah, you can keep that. No, <laughs> you need it. A uh, couple additional points while we're on this slide. Notice we still have a year or two here of of declining industry structure size supplies. The stuff that we've analyzed says we don't see, for at least a while here, much optimism for domestic demand growth to occur. So for the next year, 18 months, what it does look like is that there's profit opportunities available in this industry. And we'll close with a couple more comments on that. But going to have high prices cow-calf level at the feedlot levels, the consumer levels. And if you watch and monitor USDA projections on grain prices about a year, a year and a half from now, we could be looking at potentially, depending on where the drought issue goes, uh, $5, maybe even under $5 corn. High prices for cattle and fed cattle, feeder cattle, fed cattle, low prices for corn. There are some opportunities showing up here in the, in the near future but we think they're going to be supply driven, not so much demand driven. Uh, I had Dr. Hansen for class way back when at Nebraska, and he probably doesn't even remember me. I was in one of his classes of 125 students, but I do remember he actually did have a joke every single day of some kind. Uh, and some of them I sincerely can't repeat that I do remember. <laughs> But one that I can, and I can blame him because it's his, not mine. And that is, one day he walked in in his usual fashion and got all his stuff ready and got a smirk on his face. And he said, guys, you know what the definition of optimism is? We all kind of, you know, what's he going to tell us this time? And he said, it's when the 70-year-old retired single farmer moves to town, marries a 28-year-old co-ed, and he buys a house next to the grade school. So, that's Dr. Ron Hansen's joke for the day that I remember. And, and by now, that one, I guarantee you, is at least 34 years old, because I think, you know, it, he, he probably wasn't the originator of it. So sorry if it's, you know, really aged. But uh, I learned a little bit in ag finance beyond that. But that was one note that I just thought was uh, particularly important. So following up on that, then the most important question of today in about 10 days, Glenn and I are talking 10 years ahead, and so let's just start with an easy one. In the next 10 days, who's got this thing in the bag at the Big 12 tournament? Well, you can take your pick, but there is only one right answer here. So uh, <laughs> let me ask a little more forward-looking question. Go 10 years ahead. And as we think about where the world's going, and this relates back to some comments that Steve made already very well. Where do you think the major opportunity or the major demand for imports of beef are going to be in the next 10 years? Now, all of these are going to have important imports of beef occurring, but who's going to be the biggest? Any ideas? Some of them might surprise you. According to projections that we've compiled from USDA's estimates, U.S. and Africa, about equal by 2022. If you take Egypt and the rest of African countries together, they're going to be roughly about where the U.S. is. Certainly those other countries noted there, uh, Japan, South Korea, important export markets, but the growth potential is not exactly enormous in those areas. 
uh, South Korea perhaps, Japan still a big market but not a major grower. Uh, let me make a couple more observations here. This becomes really important when you recognize that the beef demand by these countries is quite heterogeneous. It isn't a single product. Look at the magnitude of growth in the other Asian countries, and I just listed nine of what we think are some of the more prominent opportunities for export market growth enhancement. Now, why are we talking about export market growth enhancement? I'll come back to those in a second. We already said the domestic market and demand expansion here is not likely to be very prominent. So if this industry is going to grow back up to the 30 plus million cow herd, we have got to have international demand expansion. And we are poised to have it because the international arena is gaining in affluency and wants beef. But they don't all want the same beef. But those nine countries in particular, that's about the population of one and a half, 1.7 US population wise. Some of those countries not so affluent, but all of them growing in affluency. Qatar actually, it's the richest country in the world. Now it only has a population of about two million people, but per capita GDP is $100,000. Very rich, affluent country, mostly because of our demand for natural gas and oil, which they have in abundance. But you have countries like that, Saudi, Qatar, and other countries in that list that have a very high income as the country as a whole. You have others where a segment of that country is very high income. Why is that important? Because high income is who want our high quality product. That is where we have growth opportunity in the international arena, is for our high quality product. And the reason I'll argue that is when we look at who our major competitors in the world are, and there are some who have a huge comparative advantage on us on lower quality product, at least in the ways we would define quality in our own beef herd. Uh, let's look just a little bit at, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, we've got it population growth on horizontal, income growth on the vertical. Countries that have high income and high population growth, that means we're growing in both segments of our demand sector. We've got a lot of people to feed and we've got incomes growing at the same time. Countries like China, Vietnam, Indonesia, even Sub-Saharan Africa, whose income levels are very low yet, but the growth rates are strong and robust and the population growth, significant. Now, Africa is poised to become the largest populated continent on the world in the upcoming projections of population estimates. They will surpass India within a few years because their population growth rate exceeds that of India. They also have tremendous growth in income occurring and will be another market growth area for U.S. and other beef. Let me go to the next question. Uh, so who's going to be the supplier? Who's going to be the dominant world supplier in terms of volume of beef exporting to the rest of these countries? Well, these are certainly the top four, as far as we can see in their heads, heads above anybody else. So barring any disasters, these are going to be the leaders. But it might surprise you who is projected to be the really dominant player here. The dominant player is projected to be India. India. Five years ago, they were a little glip on the slide of other countries among the 12 that were in exporting beef in addition to Canada and New Zealand and Argentina and so forth. They are skyrocketing on their beef export and it really is buffalo meat export expansion. Now, India doesn't consume much buffalo themselves. It's about a half a pound per person per year. Uh, they, they don't consume beef, of course, but buffalo they can. Beef cattle, actually, and bovine cattle themselves, you can't slaughter in, in India. But you can slaughter buffalo. And buffalo is their dairy herd, uh, one of their major dairy components. And 
that industry has realized now that you can build infrastructure, you can build uh, the health of the herd, and has invested many, many hundreds, millions of dollars into advancing their infrastructure to providing buffalo meat to the world. Now, their main markets are the low-income areas. They have a huge market. Actually, their biggest export destination right now is Vietnam. But they, they're exporting a lot of beef into African countries, exporting a lot into some other Asian countries. Uh, targeting a low quality, lower price. A typical buffalo animal that's called out of the herd, it, it has to be a, an animal that is either male or not a productive female milking. Uh, she's, they're, they're worth around $300. That's what the animal sells for. Now, you don't get an 800-pound carcass from her, but that's what they're selling for at the farm level. So you, you, have, you can't compete with that low-quality market. We can't. But they can't produce the quality product that is in higher demand from the higher income groups. So U.S., uh, they're about half of what India is projected to be. And they weren't even on the scale. Glenn and I went to to Brazil a few years ago to see what was going on there as they were escalating their beef export uh, expansion. Uh, fascinating. It was young, highly educated, uh, very dedicated folks driving that industry's future. And we've made the challenge here before, we need the same energy, youth, education back in our industry to help drive our future. I need to send Glenn to India to find out what's going on there. But, uh, <laughs> We have some, some can, things happening. Can it be a round, round trip to take it, please? <laughs> yeah. By the way, U.S.'s growth is not irrelevant. As I said, we have huge potential for our export market. Just between 2012 and 2022, if nothing else changed, we're adding about $75 plus per head fed cattle value by the export expansion. Take it away, take away 75 to 80 bucks. All right, so that is why we see so much opportunity out there. So let's wrap it up, see if there's any questions. Uh, as I mentioned, we think there's profit opportunities in the next 12 to 18 months in this industry. They're going to be there. Who's going to get them? I don't know. How are you going to allocate them? You're going to share them, right? We'll all get a fourth. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, we'll try to steal them from each other at every chance we get, but that's, you know, Steve's Hunt's model tries to, to at least get more message from consumer back to the producer. That's great. Um, but, but we see those if we can hold with drought, if we can hold off uh, any major surprises. Uh, so where is the opportunity out in our industry for growth? And it really comes down to aggressive seeking of new customers in the international arena. But it's not probably competing head to head every day with India for the low value, low priced, low quality market. It is competing and trying to provide all of the attributes that the high income sector wants. And by the way, they're not that much different in terms of the expectations on the product. The product mix might differ, but the expectations on the product in the high income international community is very similar to what the high expectations are in the American market for high quality product. It's taste. It's a desirable eating experience. It's assurance of safety. It's a product that meets all the conditions that that customer comes to expect in the U.S. as well. So we can maintain and we can build that by targeting the same things we're doing here. But remember, that market's a little more fragile. You have to every day be preparing and prepared to give that international customer what they want, recognizing that you can lose in a hurry. We've talked enough. Any questions? We've got a couple minutes, perhaps. Uh, we'd welcome any questions or comments. And obviously, there's a lot more to this whole story than we can get through in 20 minutes. While you're thinking of that last question, I'm going to assert one thing. I've got to do this to Ted, uh, or for Ted, I should say. It's important to recognize the dynamic between what we're debating now in the international environment and what 10 years from now we're saying it might look like. Right? right now in the press, all the discussions are on Russia's concerns, right? Japan opening up and so forth. Russia and Japan were two of the countries that are going to have negative population growth on one of the charts that Ted showed you, right? <laughs> Africa and other areas are where the growth is at, 
And in many ways, Africa is one of the areas we know the least about in terms of their demand interest because we've researched it the least. Right? It's important to recognize that short run, long run dynamic here and the challenges that poses and hopefully the university system can help us with that, but that's definitely a challenge in this environment. You talk about change. Did you see McDonald's is opening their first vegetarian outlet in India in 2013? Wow. McDonald's, vegetarian. Yeah, that's, I mean, we've got to be at least aware, prepared where we're going to operate in those kinds of environments. Thank you for your time. Thank you.